Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Tim Dalton, who's Procurement Manager at Lean Logistics. And today we're going to talk about what are other shippers doing, leading practices in transportation procurement. Now, this is a topic, especially this time of the year, as companies are probably already by now wrapping up uh, their, their budgets for you know 2016, and they're, they're looking at their transportation plans. Uh, you know, procurement and kind of what their strategy is moving forward uh, is something that's top of mind for a lot of, you know, transportation and logistics executives. And, and certainly this whole area of procurement um, is, uh, it seems to be always be perpetually hot, you know. So uh, certainly uh, a lot of great questions uh, and, and uh, that, I've been, that I've been receiving from shippers. And a lot of it seems to be really some, uh, what I would consider kind of fundamental basic questions around, you know, how to structure and execute a, a procurement engagement effectively. So, you know, very happy to have Tim on board, who uh, uh, again uh, leads the procu you know, procurement team there at Lean Logistics to provide some insights from from their experience in working with clients and, and shippers in, in this area. Um, you know, just a reminder for those of you that are joining us live today that you know part of our goal here at Talking Logistics is to make this conversational. So, if you do have a question for uh, for Tim uh, as we're having our conversation here, you can do so via the submit a question button or via the chat feature, and I'll keep an eye on that. And uh, certainly, if it's a good and appropriate question, I'll, I'll try to weave it into the conversation. Uh, just a reminder that if you are joining us as a visitor, you do have to sign in first before you can ask a question. Uh, so with that, Tim, uh, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me, Adrian. I appreciate it. Well, Tim, uh, like I always do with all of my guests that, that come on for the first time, I always like to get a little bit of uh, you know context or background in terms of how and why you got involved in, in supply chain logistics. So. Uh, maybe, you know, just to kick it off, uh, why don't you tell us briefly a little bit about your career path, uh, again, how and why you got involved with supply chain logistics, and what your current role and responsibilities are there at Lean Logistics. Okay. Yeah, no, great. I uh, I got into supply chain um, when I first started in college. I was working at a car ferry in northern Michigan, and I was managing uh, the commercial business, so there were over-the-road trucks and over-dimensional uh, equipment that would take a car ferry across the lake versus driving through Chicago. And, uh, and at the time, I had a friend who was going to Central Michigan University, and he told me about the logistics program there, and that uh, it was a field with uh, with opportunity. So I uh, went to Central, went through the field, really liked it. Um, started my career about 17 years ago at Total Logistic Control, where I was uh, more of an operator, where I had responsibilities for managing uh, uh, accounts for day-to-day -day execution as well as carry relationships. And I've been now at Lean Logistics for just over 10 years. Uh, I was brought over to Lean Logistics as we started our managed services department. So with that department, we are the execution arm for our customers uh, in an outsource type environment. And then approximately three years ago, I moved over to our procurement department. And uh, my current responsibilities now are, I manage a team which either provides support to our shipper customers who utilize our technology to manage their own RFPs in uh, more of a DIY type format, or we also have uh, shippers that outsource the, com uh, the procurement function to us, and then we manage uh, their procurement uh, process, uh, handle all the communications, provide the best practices, work with the carriers, and really manage that process start to finish for them uh, so then they can uh, focus on other things if they need to. Yeah, no, great, uh, great, great background. I think, you know, you just touched upon there, you know, some things that we'll probably uh, dive a little bit deeper in, in our conversation. You know, the reality that there's, you know, obviously a role for technology to play here, but uh, that there's also a, a role for uh, just having expertise and knowledge in terms of how the procurement process works. And depending on what capabilities a company may have, a shipper may have internally in terms of technology and what I call human IP or expertise, you know, that, that kind of in many ways dictates the type of solution that they might be looking for in uh, in a third party. Um, so, so let me let me start with, you know, a very basic question. And this is a, a very common question that that, uh, you know, I get a lot and, and I, I hear a lot out in the industry. And that is, you know, is there a, you know, quote unquote, right time, you know, to conduct a procurement engagement? Yeah, no, I get that question a lot, too. And I, you know, I tend to pe tell people that, there really isn't necessarily a right time. Um, you know, I tell people not to try to time the market uh, usually, and, and if anything, just to be consistent. And, and what I mean with that is, you know, if you go to market, if you do an annual RFP and if you go to market every year in August, go out the next year again in August, 
you know, the, the last thing you ever want to do is really come across to your carrier partners as if you're fishing or if it's only uh, about the, the pricing only or if they're seeing an RFP, you know, seven months after you just awarded the freight. They're going to pick up on that. And it's uh, from an overall partment, partnership standpoint and a commitment standpoint, commitment goes both ways. Uh, so I, I really tell people there's, there's no reason to really time the market. The big thing is to be consistent. But I think that, you know, some of the things kind of uh, associated with timing, you know, first you really need to understand as far as a shipper, you know, should you or should you not go to market versus actually when you go to market. And, you know, I think that, you know, a, a, a shipper is a candidate to go to market with an event, um, you know, if their current rates are, you know, nearing, uh, are, are expiring, if they've noticed that in the past several months that their usage of more of a spot market has drastically increased, uh, there's new business that they've acquired or, or changes to their network where they don't have pricing in place currently, um, or, you know, or someone's really looking just to re or rationalize their carrier base and maybe, you know, introduce more asset-based carriers uh, to the mix. You know, and, and at the same time, you know, I think there's a lot of consideration, you know, that you should look at when maybe going to market right away isn't the best for a, for a shipper. And, you know, I think, you, you know, there's no need to go to market if your current carriers, your primary carriers are taking all your freight. Um, if your only motivation is to save money, you know, I think this year the market has been somewhat soft and a lot of shippers have seen opportunities with their freight rates. Uh, but you need to be a student of the of the market. You need to understand the market. And if your only motivation is to save money uh, at all cost, um, you know, I, I think you may need to really go back and think about what you want to do from a, a uh, from a, a as far as what's best for your company and part from a long term standpoint. You know, or if your business, when looking at your business, if you have a lot of unique uh, characteristics to your business um, that you've got a good group of core carriers that are familiar with the nuances of your business and they're taking your freight or if you look at yourself as a shipper and you're not the easiest shipper to work with you may want to look at it as an opportunity to maybe fix some of the things that may be broken within your supply chain before you go to market uh, to reduce some of the risk that a carrier may see with continuing to to work with a shipper uh, the same way they always have been you know, a lot of a lot of great points there, and I think you you, uh, you you touched on one in terms of you know one is the timing of it, but the other one is really what's the motivation, right? And okay. and whether you're trying to just get these uh, you know short term wins, if you will, in terms of trying to you know time the market and try to you know in times of soft uh, soft environment, try to you know uh, you know save a few pennies more per mile. Uh, but but you're right, I think in this environment, I've had the opportunity to uh, be around a lot of carriers this year. Uh, and they're becoming more selective in terms of the type of shippers they work with, and in terms of kind of reading the signals that they get from shippers. And I uh, and I think what you know they read they pick up on these things as 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 you mentioned in terms of what is the motivation behind you know and how they go about executing you know these types of uh, these types of engagements. Definitely. So so um so, so let's start so. So we kind of addressed the first question, right? And which we talked about when's the right time and, 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 um, you know, things to think about in terms of whether to go, uh, and, and you know, plan and execute an, an engagement or whether the, you know, the status quo is, is fine. Um, but let, let's say you do want to kind of move forward. I mean, what, what kind of, uh, preliminary work or, or pre-planning is required to make sure that you're kind of preparing yourself, uh, you know, uh, as, as efficiently and effectively as possible to, you know, put together a successful engagement. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great question because I think that uh, the success of a procurement event, you know, is typically related to the work that's done up front. It's, uh, it's those shippers that tend to rush through the process just to get out to market. They're the ones that will, you know, typically miss some information that should have been communicated to the carriers. And if you start missing information and then you award the freight, you run the risk of, you know, carriers not taking the freight they've been awarded because they find out there was something that wasn't communicated to them ahead of time. So I think that, uh, you know, that preliminary work is some of the most important work that you can do. And, you know, I think with any RFP, uh, you know, when looking at the, the, the work, you know, the one thing is you're going to want to look at the lanes, you're going to want to look at the carriers that you want to invite. But I think more importantly is you want to really take a seat, uh, take a step back, look at yourself, you know, ask yourself the question, you know, are you a good shipper to work with? And uh, most will say yes, so even better yet, maybe you should take the, the opportunity to survey uh, some of your carriers just to get a feel for how they view you. And based on that feedback, 
you know, it's good to go back and look at your contracts, your accessorial programs, your fuel programs, um, whatever it may be. If you're getting feedback from your carriers that, uh, you know, that, uh, that they're held up too long at your facilities, you know, an RFP is a perfect opportunity to really look at your processes and to look at your operational base documents. And if there is a time to change, that's when you're going to want to make a change. So then if any of those changes would result in a carrier having to adjust their rate, they have the opportunity to make those adjustments uh, uh, throughout the process. Um, you know, also, I think some of that pre-planning is one, look at yourself. Are you a fair shipper? Are you a good shipper to work with? And if you're not, what can you do to correct that? Benchmark your rates. You know, there's benchmarking out there. You know, understand where you're at from a pricing standpoint. Uh, and then from there, you can determine which lanes you want to include, um, whether you want to go to market with all of uh, your lanes or whether you want to uh, uh, be somewhat targeted with your uh, with your uh, the lanes that you go to market with. You know, also from a benchmarking standpoint, I think you can do more than just benchmarking your rates. And, you know, some of the things that will help people with is, you know, looking at their field programs, looking at contracts, looking at accessorials and provide that feedback as to whether they're, you know, if, whether they're in the ballpark, you know, when compared to some of their, um, when some of their, uh, uh, with, with like shippers, you know, also, you know, when looking at your lanes, I'd, I've seen more and more recently where shippers are including their operational folks and asking them for feedback. So leverage their expertise as the, the person or persons that are, you know, in the trenches day in and day out and really look at your lanes as well and identify some of those lanes that may not be broken today. And you may find situations where it makes sense to not include a certain lane on, uh, on your RFP. And it may uh, make sense to either negotiate ahead of time or extend pricing ahead of time with the carrier that's, uh, with, that's doing a good job. And I think, and, and lastly, I think is, you know, I mentioned before with the first question is be a student of the industry. You know, look for any of the intelligence that you can find that's out there. And as you're making that decision to go to market and as you're looking at yourself, also ensure that you're setting realistic expectations internally. Because I think what happens at times is that if, 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 if you're not making setting uh, realistic expectations, you're kind of then held to whatever you communicated uh, to your leadership as far as what the opportunity is from a saving standpoint. And I think in those situations, it, it can make it so you may make decisions that you wouldn't normally make as far as who to award freight to. But as long as you have a clear plan that you articulate throughout your organization and you've set clear expectations, you know, I think a lot of times when it comes to actually awarding the freight, you're actually able to make award decisions that are best for the business versus trying to hit a specific uh, savings number or percentage. Yeah, no, a lot of, a lot of great advice there, and in particular, the last point in terms of the, the importance of uh, uh, really understanding the, the market, understanding the environment, understanding kind of the status quo where you are today and, and, and understanding where you want to be, right? And then being able to clearly communicate that, you know, across the organization, particularly, you know, to upper management, right? Because there you're, you're the more realistic the expectations and, and true to uh, operating reality that you can, you know, communicate and set those objectives, you know, the, the, the better able you are to, um, you know, uh, hit them and, and to be uh, more realistic in, in setting those expectations. Um, you know, you touched upon this a little bit. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I'm seeing is this trend towards shippers taking a more holistic, integrated approach to, you know, procurement, you know, where they're looking at, you know, the, the transportation network, you know, as a whole, you know, across all modes, inbound and outbound, um, you know, versus looking at just portions of, of their network or, you know, you know, doing uh, ocean first and then truckload second and, and things like that. Are, are you seeing you know, that trend as well. And are there cases, and I think you mentioned there are cases, but, but are there cases where maybe taking a more targeted approach makes sense? I mean, how do you, how do you decide between, you know, taking a more integrated holistic approach versus taking more targeted approach? Yeah, no, I think it, uh, I've seen both ways this year and uh, it really varies on the shipper. You know, we have some shippers that we work with today that they don't go to market at all. You know, they've got their rates that, you know, technically go out forever. And, you know, if they, if a carrier comes in uh, and asks for a rate increase, they look at it as a kind of a one-off solution and don't necessarily go to market at all. Um, you know, as far as those that do go to market, it, it's, it, I've seen that trend, you know, that trend this year. 
Uh, but but in a lot of cases, it's really a mixed bag. I mean, I, we, we have a lot of shippers that are going to market with their entire uh, networks. Um, you know, but there is a lot more homework that's going on this year than in years before. And I kind of mentioned that with the last question. Uh, there's, there are a lot more targeted uh, based RFPs that I'm seeing this year. You know, I think from a, a separating it from a mode type standpoint, yeah, most are, you know, including all their intermodal or their, their truckload freight together. Um, you know, I'd see that from that holistic viewpoint of it. I'd say that uh, the LTL component of a procurement event is still that piece that um, I haven't seen a lot of LTL procurement activity this year. Uh, most of it's been around uh, the truckload and intermodal piece. But even when there is LTL activity, that's still the, uh, the mode that's kind of separate just because it's its own animal. Um, you know, and there's so much more that goes into LTL as far as, you know, that learning curve. If you're bringing on a new carrier at your facility and there's there's so much more that goes into it that uh, uh, the LTL one is kind of is one of the modes I see separately. Truckload to intermodal are together. And uh, from a, a lane standpoint, um, there's just a lot more, a lot more homework that's going into it. And I, I probably see just as many full network based RFPs as I see smaller targeted based RFPs. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I, you know, I think I see the same thing, you know, uh, I, I think it's, a, you know, it really varies by, by company and by industry and kind of where they are in the, uh, on the maturity level, if you will, in terms of, uh, you know, their experience doing, uh, doing procurement. And um, uh, so it's so a great, I mean, are you seeing, I mean, obviously for a lot of, you know, retailers, manufacturers, parcel is kind of a growing you know, mode out there. Are, are you seeing kind of increased activity around the partial side? And that's that in many ways, it's it's its own separate animal too. Oh, without question. And, and we haven't seen uh, a lot of procurement type events around parcel, but parcel is, it's, it's gaining traction as far as the questions that are being asked. And whereas before we, you know, rarely were asked about parcel, um, it, it seems that it's uh, kind of forefront right now, and we're, we're get, starting to get a lot more questions around Parcel, but we haven't seen a, a lot of procurement activity around Parcel. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think it, it is one of those things that's uh, uh, a growing in, in interest and demand, particularly for companies uh, that historically haven't done Parcel in the past that now are kind of new to, to this mode, if you will, and where their volumes are starting to grow, and, and, and they're looking to take a smarter approach to, you know, how they uh, – uh, procure parcel and you know track it and, and track the spend and all that. So uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, l let's talk about you know carrier strategy now. Uh, you know you know first what you know what factors should you know shippers uh, consider when determining which you know carriers to work with and second how do shippers decide between kind of incumbent carriers versus you know bringing in new carriers into the network. Yeah, I think that uh, you know as we talked about before some of that preliminary work. You know, as you're you're looking at yourselves, you're looking at your practices. I think the other big thing then is, you know, ensuring that you actually have a strategy. Because to answer a lot of those questions, you can only really answer those questions if you've thought about it and if you have a strategy in place. So I think that as you're preparing for a bid, you either 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 need to look at your carrier strategy and make adjustments where it makes sense, or if you don't have one, really look to create one. And I think that'll help as far as that driving document to help understand you know, what the goals are of the organization are when it comes to asset brokerage, what's that preferred split that you'd like to see or what's that, you know, from a, a, an optimal award solution standpoint, what percent would you like to see go into asset or brokerage? Um, you know, I think it makes sense when you're looking at from an incumbency standpoint, new carriers, uh, so incumbent carriers or new carriers. You know, I think it makes sense to obviously always look to, uh, to maybe add some new carriers that you haven't worked with in the past. But, you know, at the, a lot of times you, you still want to be cautious when you're making those decisions and make sure that it makes sense. Your incumbent carriers, you've got a, a proven track record with. They know your lanes. They know your facilities. They know your customers. So with what I've seen is a lot of times when, when folks are going through their procurement event and it comes time to making their award decision, you know, it's not uncommon that when those decisions are being made, you know, people are locking themselves in a conference room and they're starting to go through lane by lane. They're starting to identify, you know, who the carriers are that are hauling their freight today, um, you know, by looking at looking in their TMS and seeing, you know, comparing the load in the TMS as far as what's been going on to that of 
all the pricing that they receive back from the carriers. And I think there's a lot more discussion right now as far as, you know, who the incumbents are, what the value, what value do they bring, what lanes may be linked with an incumbent carrier as far as, you know, you give them a lane. They might not be the cheapest carrier on, you know, lane A to B, but they do all these other lanes for you and, you know, it makes sense to, to include them on an existing lane. You know, so I think there's, there's definitely opportunity you want to look at new carriers. You, you always want to, you know, make sure, one, make sure your incumbents are competitive, but also as capacity continues to tighten up, you know, if, uh, if you continue to only work with your incumbent carriers, you're going to, you're going to probably put, get yourself in trouble, uh, especially as, you know, capacity. I mean, it's, again, we mentioned that it's been soft this year, but that's not going to last forever. So I think there's opportunity to bring new carriers in. Uh, the one thing that I always caution folks is, is that, you don't ever want to be viewed as a shipper that, again, is out there fishing for rates and is basically wasting people's time. So understand what's important to your business, whether it's uh, you're looking to add more assets, you know, from the overall safety standpoint, um, you know, are there certain, you know, uh, safety or CSA type uh, measurements that a carrier needs to achieve? Or is there a certain size of a carrier that they need to meet uh, before you would bring them into your mix? Um, you want to look for carriers that offer more than just one mode as there may be additional opportunities in the future. And you really want to understand who are those carriers that you want to work with. And if you, a carrier comes to you asking to, to, to participate in an RFP and based on who that carrier is, you know that it's unlikely that you're going to award them freight. It's good to cast a wide net, but at the same time, you don't want to, you don't want to build a reputation or, or, get the reputation of wasting people's time. So if you're looking at a carrier, if carrier's asking you for freight opportunities, but you know you're not going to award them freight ahead of time, have the conversation with them ahead of time uh, rather than wasting their time to include them on a bid where you know that uh, it's unlikely that they're going to be awarded any freight. And I think too, a uh, real quick, I think from a strategy standpoint, as you're devising that strategy, not only is it understanding new and incumbent carriers, who are those carriers that you want to work with, but it's also good to, to start to uh, start to kind of classify your carriers. You know, are they, uh, you know, are they niche carriers? Are they core carriers? You know, and really start to understand, um, you know, what based on their classification of the carrier, when should you meet with them? When should you be talking? And really start to look at your carrier relationships as being that true partnership. You had mentioned it before when you're talking about how carriers are becoming a little bit more selective as far as the freight that they're looking to haul. You know, I've, I've, talk, I've heard from a lot of different carriers this year when they tell me that, uh, you know, they now look at every opportunity through the eyes of the driver because the, you know, either retaining or attracting drivers as, uh, is a problem and it's going to continue to become a problem. So work with your carriers regardless of whether they're incumbents or they're going to be new carriers to build the relationship but also have open back and forth discussions as far as how you guys can help each other. No, a lot of great uh, uh, advice and, and food for thought there. And I, I think it just underscores the point you made earlier in terms of the importance of, of pre-planning, right? And, and pre-thinking through these things. And I think that's a dimension here with regards to carrier strategy and, and thinking through these questions in terms of, you know, what, what type of carriers you want to work with? What's, what type of profile? What kind of requirements uh, I, I, do you want to impose on them? Um, and then really thinking through that whole incumbent versus new carriers. And I agree. I think the the uh, you know what I see with a lot of shippers is that there is generally speaking this preference to maintain and grow their relationships with the incumbent carriers, particularly those that have been you know uh, uh, meeting their uh, uh, you know providing really excellent service and really understands their business very well. But obviously from a from a risk management standpoint, whether it's capacity tightening or whatever other case might be, you really do need to you know, work in and, and start developing, you know, secondary relationships with, with other carriers out there just to, um, again, not have all your eggs in one basket from, you know, even just purely from a risk management uh, standpoint. Um, you know, you, you, you touched upon this a, a little bit already, but I just want to dive a little bit deeper. I mean, another trend I'm seeing is, you know, increased use of benchmarking and, and market intelligence in, in the procurement process. I mean, first, where can shippers, you know, find, you know, this benchmarking data and, and market intelligence? And, and second, how are shippers, you know, leveraging it, you know, leveraging this information to, you know, achieve better results? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think you're right. I think uh, benchmarking is becoming that much more important. There's a lot of, a lot of folks or a lot of services out there that can provide that information, um, you being one of them. Uh, 
and you know there's it's important to be a, a student of the industry uh, from an overall benchmarking standpoint when it comes to rates you know there's a there's a variety of benchmark tools out there and you know when I talk to people about benchmarking or you know some of the things that they can take should take into consideration when when benchmarking is there isn't a perfect benchmarking tool that's out there you know there's multiple tools but so many of them are there they're, they're going to be based off of what their inputs are and they're also going to be based on you know what their algorithm algorithms are based on you know where they may not have executed uh, data uh, when determining what an index rate is so when using benchmark tools you know i use our index uh, tool we have an index tool but at the same time you know I, you know i tell people to use a secondary index tool i don't i i tend to to use about two index tools so i can kind of get that gut check when looking at rates and, and really kind of getting a feel for what's going on in the marketplace um you know i think it's important to to use more than one and the other thing too is you have to understand that you know your business may not necessarily align completely with what the benchmark rate may give so if you see that you know from point a to point b the benchmarks at you know a dollar 25 and again it's obviously low but if it's at a dollar 25 and you're at a dollar 50 you know it doesn't mean necessarily that you're that far off or that you're not procuring transportation the way that uh, that you should be uh, because there are a lot of factors and programs and fuel programs accessorials that really play into that so you know i tend to use the benchmarking tools as a gauge to see what's going on in the market as far as a month to month or a year over year change and when it comes to benchmarking i i find it very valuable to benchmark a shipper against themselves and see if their own trends are in line with what's going on in the marketplace and you almost use that as more of that opportunity, as more of that gauge to really determine how you're doing when compared to the market. And beyond rates, and I mentioned it before, you know, I, I think that from a, uh, being competitive, you know, trying to get yourself to that point where if, you know, if two loads are being tendered to a carrier and wanting that carrier to, if they got one truck and two loads come in, you want them to take your load. Uh, you know, it's also an opportunity in addition to benchmarking rates but also benchmark your program. So, you know, are you, uh, you know, are you in the ballpark when it comes to fuel, accessorials, you know, where are you at from a wait, wait time standpoint? So there's a lot of other things that you can benchmark in addition to rates. Uh, as, over, as far as overall, um, you know, market intelligence, you know, I look at blogs and I look at, you know, uh, different, uh, you know, listen to different experts, uh, you know, such as yourself. But also, I mean, you know, I use other, you know, uh, documents or, or, or monthly uh, reporting tools as well just to kind of, you know, stay up to speed with what's going on in the marketplace so I can continue to educate the shippers that I work with uh, because then it, it's kind of all tied together. But then that leads uh, them to be in a be better uh, position to set realistic expectations. So, yeah, benchmarking, it's a trend. You're hearing more and more about it. Uh, you know, you'd probably be silly not to use it uh, because you really need to kind of see where you're at the best that you can but also then use it as an opportunity not to say that i'm doing terrible at my job but use it as an opportunity to find areas where you can improve yeah no i i, I agree with 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 your points i mean i i, I like i like the phrase that that you, you you've kept using which is you know be a student of the market i think that's uh, particularly important um and really leveraging multiple sources of information i mean i think that's 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 another important point right because you know, uh, if you rely simply on just one source or one that type of data point, you know, you're, you're getting a, a partial view, right? The more data and information intelligence you can gather, you know, it gives you a, a more, uh, uh, again, a, a, a clearer picture, perhaps or a more complete picture of what's really happening out there. And I think the other piece that you brought up, which I think is very important, is to, to look beyond the number, right? There, there might be reasons why you might be below or above, the, uh, you know, a particular number and really understanding the, the, the qualitative factors that might be contributing, you know, behind the scenes, uh, and particularly, you know, doing some qualitative benchmarking, right, uh, with other shippers uh, in terms of being a shipper of choice, like you talked about before, right? Are there things that you could be doing to help carriers turn their assets faster, for example, uh, or pay them quicker, um, you know, leveraging technology in a, in a different way, right? So, so I think there's, there's benchmarking that goes beyond the, the market rates, but even, you know, talking about benchmarking your overall process, which, which I think is important. Um, so, so, so let's talk about now, you know, at the end of the day, you know, how do you measure whether a procurement engagement was 
successful or not, right? You talked about kind of you're setting the, you want to set the clear and realistic expectations, you know, up front. You know, how do you then go after the fact and 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 measure or say, hey, you know, we we were successful. What are some of the what are some of the ways that uh, shippers can do that? Yeah, I think the easy answer is to say, you know, are you, did you save money or lose money? But you know, I I, I kind of say that in a joking manner because it goes on so much more than that. And you know, when I'm working with shippers and they're asking questions about how should they measure or how I see others measure, the greatest measure of success, in my opinion, is after you've gone live with the results from the RFP, that the carriers are actually picking up the freight that you awarded to them. Um, you know, I, I always tell people that when we're I'm first engaging with them on a, a procurement opportunity is, you know, I'm not a consultant. I'm not here to to point to a number on a piece of paper and say, look how great of a job we did and look how much money we saved you. You know, I've got that operator's background. So, you know, I always look at it kind of with that operations type mindset is, okay, am I going to be able to execute the awards that I made? So, you know, from a, a success standpoint, you know, I think that, uh, you know, obviously, you know, going back to it, what I mentioned first, overall, you know, savings is an opportunity. Really, you know, determining what your, bent, your baseline should be, um, how do you want to measure it? Are you looking at an average rate paid by lane for the last year? Are you a shipper that has your that has a budget, uh, a granular budget where it goes down to that lane level? But really, it's kind of understanding, um, you know, how you're being measured and how your company is measuring success, and then create your baselines off of that. Uh, go through, select carriers that you feel are going to be able to do the do the job. Uh, even if after the RFP is done and you've gone through a couple of rounds and you're going through your awards process, there's nothing to say that you can't also do that one-off negotiating with carriers, especially those incumbent carriers, as you're finalizing your award decisions. And I think that with any procurement event, success from the procurement event also is what happens after you've awarded the freight. Use the opportunity of a procurement event to, to really reestablish the relationships with your carriers. Um, Create a cadence to get back to to get together with your carriers. Maybe your core carriers you're getting together on a um, you're having a call on a monthly basis. Maybe it's some of those niche carriers you're get talking to them every six months. Whatever it may be, but use it as an opportunity to have conversation, to build relationship, and, and to really ensure that everything that was awarded and all expectations that have been set throughout the process are being followed on both sides. Um, you know, a shipper is committing freight to a carrier, but and so therefore the shipper feels that the commitment on the carrier is to pick up the freight, but the commitment goes both ways. So I think uh, a successful procurement event ends with uh, hopefully you're saving some money, but also the carriers that you've awarded freight to are actually picking up your freight. Your metrics are being met and that your relationships are stronger as you look at it from more of a long-term standpoint versus just a short-term fix. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think a lot of times, um, uh, you know, what I tell folks is, you know, I think the, the ultimate gauge is how executable was the end result, right? I mean, it's a lot of times, you know, people fo hyper focus on, I mean, the, the worst mistake companies can do just to be, you know, uh, to, to focus on one extreme is to pick the lowest cost carrier on every single lane, right? Um, but then when you peel back the onion, a lot of those carriers may not have enough equipment, they may not have, you know, the, the type of service level, so on and so forth. And then what you end up seeing on the execution side is, uh, you know, a lot of tender rejects, uh, acceptance rate, right? You go, going down and you're kind of falling down in your routing guide, you know, to the fourth, fifth or sixth, you know, spot, things like that. And, and that obviously impacts costs and service, so on and so forth. So to me, you know, to your point, kind of more holistically is looking around how executable, right, was the overall uh, plan that came out of that procurement engagement. And I think that's reflected in a variety of metrics, not just on the cost side, but you know, tender acceptance rate, service levels, you know, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, we're kind of coming up short on time here. I've got a couple of other questions. I just want to remind those of you that are watching us live that if you do have a question for for Tim, that now would be the time to to ask it. And again, if you are signed in as a visitor, um, you will have to sign in first, um, you know, sign up with Spreecast first to be able to ask a question. Uh, so, so Tim, you know, kind of building off what we just talked about, can you share with us some, you know, use cases or, Customer examples that you know kind of help illustrate kind of the type of you know benefits that uh, you know shippers can achieve by taking a, a smarter approach to uh, transportation procurement. Uh, yeah, no, I uh, you know I, I can a couple examples this year you know based on what we've already talked about is 
One would, I guess, be uh, an example around setting realist, realistic expectations. You know, we've got shippers that, uh, you know, who pay attention to the market as they're getting ready to go to, to bid. They, uh, they state the case as to why they're going to bid. Uh, you know, even if they feel because of benchmarking that there's an opportunity to save 10%, um, you know, one of our shippers will communicate it that the opportunity is closer to either you know, breaking even or maybe saving one or two percent or even losing one or two percent. And by setting those expectations, it gives shippers the leeway to make uh, decisions that are best for the business versus trying to hit a number. And with one of the shippers that I'm referring to right now, by setting those relationship or by those expectations and making the award decisions based off of that, you know, if you look at their routing guides, the primary carrier on the lane, um, isn't maybe an incumbent with a higher rate than the next two or three backup carriers. So if the primary carrier doesn't take it, they're probably saving money by going to the second or third carriers in line, but they do it because of relationship. They do it because of the service service that they've received. And ultimately because, you know, from a customer standpoint, it's the best thing to do for their business. So, you know, we've seen opportunities of where there's been success stories based on setting those uh, expectations. We've also seen people as they're going through the RFP process and they're, and we're talking with them and they're really identifying, you know, what their lane structure is. How are, how, how have they awarded freight before? You know, we've got shippers recently who, um, you know, I think they saw about a, a 9% savings opportunity, uh, based on moving from more of a, a region to region or point to region type lane basis to more point to point. You know, carriers want information. They don't want to be surprised. And if they're submitting pricing based on a larger region, uh, you know, they're going to have to build in some risk depending on, you know, what could be the worst possible place that they could go within that region and what are the opportunities to get out. So, you know, I think with anything, it's, it's providing good information. It's, uh, it's giving the carriers the data that they need in order to, to put their best foot forward. And we've seen some opportunities through that. And I think another thing that I saw recently, uh, and I also hit on it earlier, was take the time during the, the during the prep component of the process to survey your carriers, whether it's a formal survey or whether it's you picking up the phone and calling your top three or four carriers, ask them how you are as a shipper. You know, push them to be candid because in the beginning they probably won't want to be, but uh, find out what you could be doing better and start to implement those changes where you can. Uh, I saw a shipper recently who've done that, who did that, and they found out that they weren't as easy of a shipper to work with as they thought. And they found that, you know, a lot of times, you know, their drivers don't want to take their loads because of the wait time. And what that shipper did was they used the opportunity to start implementing some changes, bring in all the stakeholders of their business to ensure that everybody understood kind of what the direction was going to be. And they, they had a process where they proved out that they were going to make these changes first. So it wasn't all lip service. So then when they got time, when it came time to actually sending out the RFP, a lot of their incumbent carriers saw already that they were being heard. And as a result, when the carriers came back, uh, they saw that their incumbent carrier pricing came back more competitive. And ultimately they, uh, they saw more capacity from their incumbent carriers, uh, and not even taking into consideration capacity that they saw from their new. So, um, you know, those are different examples. I, and I think a lot of it really, you know, kind of all go back to what you do from a prep standpoint, because in my mind, the, the prep standpoint is the most important, is the most important component of that uh, procurement process. Yeah, no, great, great examples. I mean, one of my key takeaways from our conversation today that I really hadn't thought about, um, which I think the, the last example you just talked about underscores is really the, the, you know, looking at the procurement engagement as a catalyst for uh, continuous improvement in terms of, you know, looking to see how you can be a better shipper, right, in the eyes of, of carriers, right, and using that pl planning process as, uh, you know, a mechanism to do that. And perhaps, per the last example you just gave, taking some actions and steps to, you know, um, uh, address issues that might be uh, perhaps easily fixed or at least uncovered that uh, you can then, um, you know, by addressing them up front, you know, will lead to more positive results from a from a procurement engagement. So, I, so I think that's one of my uh, key takeaways from our from our talk today, which I hadn't really you know thought about and and uh, uh, hadn't heard other shippers doing. So that's great. 
Um, you know, so Tim, you know, we're, we're kind of uh, 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 getting close to a uh, uh, time limit here. So let me just go ahead and, and ask my last question kind of as a as a way to wrap up. I mean, what questions should, you know, shippers ask themselves to, to assess if their transportation procurement strategy and, and practices are, are built on a strong foundation for, for success? You know, I think first and foremost, if you're going to ask yourself questions is, are you a good partner? You know, I think that if you, uh, you know, if you asked 15 shippers the question, are you a shipper at choice, they're probably all going to say yes. And I think that the shipper in choice term is it's overused and it's easy to say, um, but there also needs to be some action around it as well. So I think that it's important to be a shipper of choice and everything that we've all talked about before as far as what it is. Those things are important, but the biggest things to ask yourself is, are you a good partner? Are your contracts fair? Uh, are you are you soliciting and feedback from your carrier partners? Are you only picking up the phone and calling your carriers when they miss a load? Or are you setting up time to talk to your carriers and have conversations with them to really understand what their needs are along with yours versus just calling them when they've, when they've failed? And, and, you know, and the other question is too is, as you're looking at your strategies, whether you're either reviewing or you're creating, when you're going to market, when you're talking to your carriers, are you looking at everything from a long-term standpoint or a short-term fix? And I think if you start asking yourself some of those questions, you'll realize that, you know, in some situations that you may not be doing as good of a job as you thought, where you can start to make some of those corrections. Your carriers will then start to see that they're being heard. And then when it comes down to, you know, hopefully when it comes down to, you know, that carrier being offered two loads and they got one truck, hopefully you can continue to put yourself in a better position where your load is the one that they're accepting. No, great, uh, uh, great advice, uh, uh, Tim. And, uh, you know, we, we could probably go on for, for another hour or two on, on this topic since it is such a, uh, you know, meaty, you know, topic and so many dimensions uh, to it. But I, I think we did a, uh, you did a nice job kind of providing some great advice and, and food for thought for some of these basic questions and basic but important questions that many shippers have with regards to, you know, how to uh, uh, go about a transportation procurement engagement. So, again, thank you very much for spending the time with us today. Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, the opportunity, and uh, and thank you very much for your time as well. I appreciate it. You know, we didn't uh, – I want to thank all of you that joined us live today. We didn't get any questions live, but uh, if you are watching this episode on demand and you've got a question for Tim – uh, you can find this episode on TalkingLogistics.com, and uh, you can post a question there for Tim, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. So, again, thank you all for joining us today, and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.